and it was just, it was so in my face. And I didn't understand why that was my word for the year until March. And the phrase was, keep going. And when March happened and everything shut down, the first thought was, was keep going. Big it up, big it up. Yeah. All right, welcome to Let's Talk Real. We're here with Ray Allen of The Real. What a coincidence. <laughs> All right, Little Rock, Arkansas. Tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, where you're from. Yeah, uh, from Arkansas. So I've been a real estate agent, uh, I guess, man, since I've been in real estate since 06. I've been licensed agent since 07. Oh, I thought you said since you were six. No, I was since I was six. The youngest. Oh, yeah, we'll we'll right. yeah. go. Like, I've always been interested in real estate. You know, I was walking the timberland with my grandfather when I was little and stuff. And he would talk about what the land used to be before it was timber, you know, it was a farm. And he'd talk about everything you could do if you owned your own land. So I think he actually probably instilled that in me that young of what you could do if you owned your own property. So I've always been kind of fascinated with real estate. Okay. And so yeah. 06, you got- 06, I was an assistant to a whole bunch of real estate agents in Northwest Arkansas. Okay. I helped them market like 49 million in property. And I thought, wow, my life would be a lot different had I sold that much. So I'm gonna get my license. So I got licensed in January of 2007, and we had an amazing four or five months. I was gonna <laughs> say, that was like, oh. yeah. yeah, I was like, I sold my first house in the, in the first two weeks, and I sold several houses up until, the, it was like, it was almost like somebody just turned off the faucet, and everyone was kind of looking around, wondering what was going on. And I'll never forget this one investor. He had contacted me to buy uh, huge plots of land. And he was an investor in hospitals. He would buy an old hospital, renovate the hospital, and then either keep it with his new management firm or they would resell it. But that was his job. And so he contacted me and he said, hey, would you meet me at this private airport? And I want you to pitch me land that you have. Um, and I was like, okay. So he told me what he was looking for. It was gonna be him and his brother-in-law. And so I show up, just me, fairly new agent, mm -hmm. and I show up to this little private room and there's all these brokers and a salesperson that have been in the business for years. And it was a basically a pitch competition. And I had no idea that it was going to be a pitch competition at all. And so everyone's sitting around and there's this private plane that pulls up to the door this guy comes down, opens the door. He's dressed to the hilt in a suit and everyone's like starting to talk to this guy. And then in walks this older guy in sneakers and a tennis shoes. And so I go up to him, I start talking to him. He's the rich guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> everyone else was talking to the pilot. And so I start talking with him, just kind of small talk. And then everyone else kind of eventually figures it out and starts talking to him. So he sits us around and he says, we're going to go around the room. I want you to tell me who you are. Why don't you tell me who you work for? I want you to pitch me the land deal you got. And so we're going around the rim and I'm probably almost third to last. And everyone's standing up and doing a really good job pitching their properties, stand up, pitch property, stand up, pitch property. And I had like six or seven options, none of them my listings. And so I stood up and I started talking about everyone's listings that were around the table. And they were talking about this person that pitched their property. And I told him additional details about that property and all this stuff that I'd done all the research on. And so we sit down and he's like, okay, we'll let you know who we're gonna use in a couple of days. And I left and that was it. But I got a call two days later. He said, we chose you. He said, not only did you know the, the properties, but you knew everyone else's property and more details than they knew. Mm -hmm. And I, because I was a new agent, like I was just gonna, I didn't have anything else to do. So I found uh, everything I could. Yeah. So, uh, well, anyway, he said, um, you won, we're going to go with you because you, not only did you know, um, uh, the property, you knew everyone else's property and you had more information because I was new. I just had time to dive into it. So I won them over. We started looking at land. It was like $1 million, $2 million plots of land, beautiful plots. We got to go drive them and everything. It was an amazing experience. And he calls me one day and he says, young man, I don't normally do this, but I'm calling to tell you that we're not going to buy anything. And we were just going to make an offer. And I was already like, honey, this is going to be great. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be some good money. We're going to have a great Christmas. Like, here it comes, babe. This is what we've been waiting on. And he was like, we're not buying anything. 
And I was like, what? He said, I'm calling you because you seem smart. Really like working with you, but the real estate market's going to crash and I'll be able to, I'll be able to uh, pay a third of what this property is worth in a year or two. And I was like, oh no, that, you know, everyone always says that the market's not going to crash. And he said, you know, man, I'm telling you the market's crashing. You better find something else to do. And I was like, okay, crazy old guy. Right. Uh, he was exactly right. About four or five months later, the whole thing went to pot. I mean, we know the stories, right? So it was, a. Uh, will never forget that and how he was able to look at the economy and look at the future and figure out. So ever since then, I've been paying hard attention to news headlines and the economy and the bond market and all this stuff because his ability to read, it wouldn't have, he didn't predict the crash. Mm -hmm. He read what was happening and didn't allow his own bias, which was a beautiful hunting property in Arkansas that he really wanted. He didn't allow the data, his bias to cloud the data. He was able to look at the data and interpret the data with no bias. And so that was something that, I think that's even in the book, Rich Dad's Guide to Investing, he talks about that. But it's something that I was like, well, that's in my career, I will know the data and be unbiased and, and just know it cold. Deliver the facts. And, yeah. that's, and, it, and that's what even fostered that relationship. Yeah. Because the agents knew their properties and they yeah. were, I guess, pitching their, sounded like they were pitching their own property. Oh, right. Well, right. you came in <clears throat> and, it, and it could have been, like you said, because you were new out of necessity, yeah. what else to do? Let me go get to work studying. I had but, no other property. But you, <laughs> but you, but that, that's how you, yeah. that, that was kind of like your launching pad. Yeah. And it also, you know, to this day, we have a podcast that does real estate news and headlines. We've been doing it for five years. That podcast, one of the reasons why we do that is to have people's head in the game to where you could come to our podcast and know exactly what's happening. And in about an hour, hour and a half, you know, all the real estate news and headlines, what's happening in the industry and what the most important things to focus in on are. And that came from those type of things I learned years ago. Show the name. Uh, what's the, now it's called This Week in Real Estate. Okay. Uh, hosted by the Bearded Men of Real Estate. So we, we used to call it the Bearded Men of Real Estate, but people were like, what is this? Is this like houses and beard oil? It's like, no, it's not. My co-host also has a big beard, so so how we so, so you, you're stuck with it, like yeah, I know, right? We can't we, we can't take cut it if you wanted to. <laughs> no, <laughs> so so we're on. We have basically two names. You can look us up, but this week in real estate, TY, that's what we call it for short. But uh, yeah, that's been. I mean, that's been a long. We do it every week, every right. week on Wednesday. Good stuff. And so that's yeah. that's a good segue to data. And we've yeah. been talking. We learn. You know, we're students. We learn about how important the data is, the, you know, either the, whether it's the lagging data or the leading data, how has that experience in, you know, kind of investigating and studying and learning the yeah. data back then, what you learned from that older gentleman in terms of his skill set yeah. of analyzing data, how has that shaped your business today? Well, an interesting part of what he did was he interpreted the data without regard to what the news was saying because the news was also saying, oh, it's not gonna be that bad, it's not a big deal, it's just a little bump, you know, we're, we're recovering for the most part. And so he was actually going against the grain of what most news commentators were saying back then, except for one or two. And so it's really kind of pushed me to go beyond the headlines to where when you see the headlines talking about, uh, you know, just last week, we were talking about one that said that, uh, I think it was home prices are dropping or plummeting or something like that, but the, they weren't really, it was just down like 0.1% or 0.8%. I mean, you would almost call that flat, but the headline to get people to read the article, because now it's not a newspaper, they have to sell a click. Right. And if the headline's not juicy enough for you to click, then you'll just know the headline and you won't know any of the data inside of it. So they try to get a real juicy headline, you click it, you start to read it, it's not really that big of a deal. And that's just a repeating pattern in almost all the articles that we cover. And so a big part of our show is talking about the headline and then looking at the actual data. And then we basically, because it's a live show, we take comments, we just open it up like, what do you guys, is this actually a big deal or is it not a big deal? Most of the time, it is not a big deal, but the headline is so sensational that you'd think the world's crashing around you. But we have to understand that if we're getting our news from outlets mm -hmm. that are paid per click, then what they write has to be sensational enough for them to pay their bill. Right? If they can't pay the bill, then the journalist doesn't make any money either. It's just how we're set up. But there are news outlets or there are ways to find the information, but now you have to be educated enough to be able to read a release from you know, some kind of economic body to know what they're saying. 
So when they say, here's the differences in listings from this year to that year, here's the differences in sold from this year to that year, a news commentator is going to take those solds and say, look, the sold properties are 12% lower than what they were last year. But then when you actually look at the number of listings, listing volume is also down. down so if that's the case, then there's almost no difference in the number of listings to solds. So we're in a pretty steady market. This is not a bad market. It's just a market in which you have a lot of people that don't want to put their home on the market right now. Yeah. So a little less inventory means a little less sales. Yeah. Uh, well, for the average agent, mm -hmm. for us, I mean, this is our opportunity to now take market share because we can actually improve services and do more to offer our buyers additional services to find those properties that the average agent wouldn't. Okay. So tell, tell us about that. How do, how do you do that? And what is your, and I mean, we kind of, we, ju we jumped right into it. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, I love it. I love it. But tell, yeah. tell us like, you know, the, the clients you serve, you know, kind of what your, what your team looks like, what your, what's your, what's your building, you know? Yeah. So our team is called Pixel Properties. We're brokered by Real Broker. Uh, there are three people on my team currently, but we're kind of in a massive growth mode. We need to add more people to our team just based on the, on the leads that we're getting. We're getting about 10 or 12 leads a day. And so we just need to add more people in order to service everyone like we think they should be serviced. We, we got national recognition from our marketing on the listing side in a totally different market. So when houses were sitting for 120 days on market, we were selling them in 30 days or less. And that was like so fast, you know, right. which is it's not now it's like 30 days. What's wrong with the property? But back then 30 days was huge. If you could sell a house in less than 30 days, our strategy, what we were doing to do it is just math. We looked at 90 to 120 days and how much exposure a property had on a big website like Zillow, Trulia, Realtor.com, those websites. Mm -hmm. And let's just say for easy numbers sake, in those 90 days or 120 days, that property received 60,000 overall views. Well, how can we get 60,000 views in three weeks? What can we do? Trying to compress it. Right. It's the same amount of views because that math works. 60,000 views, the house sells. Eight showings, you get the offer, mm -hmm. right? So we know the math. So how can we make that in a shorter period of time? So we would do professional photos, videos, drone tours, 360 tours, all that kind of stuff. And each piece of content we created around the property, we would then distribute it any way possible. So if, if there is a social network, we were testing it out to see if we could get the views because it was all about getting the 60,000 views in that time period. And I heard you make a, you know how to make a video or two. Yeah, we do some videos. Okay. Yeah, that, that also happened by necessity. I was working for another company at the time and I was pretty poor and we had kind of restarted. So I guess to back up to go forward, the market crashed around us and I wound up doing a commercial real estate and business brokerage, I wound up owning a restaurant and a marketing company, all that kind of stuff in the middle. When the world was crashing around us, I was just staying alive. Like, what can you do, right? right? So then when the market starts to stabilize again in about 2013, I changed markets to central Arkansas. And uh, that's where my wife's from. I'm from a little further south than that. And I just went full bore into residential real estate. I focused on processes and systems, what made this client client's experience fantastic, and why was this one a phenomenal failure, mm -hmm. right? What could I have said? What could I have done? How could I have negotiated better, set expectations better, whatever it was. At the end of about two and a half years, I was one of the top agents in the area. So I thought, wow, I should start telling people. So we focused on marketing. Okay. The marketing is kind of what started to put us in a national spotlight because I was, <clears throat> I was at this other agency. I didn't have any of my own listings. I was going to do two open houses, one on Saturday, one on Sunday. I was going out to shoot the video for the open house and the, by video, I mean like it was on my cell phone. I was just going to do that. And like, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, Maybe. Trying to figure it out. Yeah, it was. I was using iMovie and an iPhone 4 or 3. And I got word that one of the houses just sold, so they didn't want to hold the home open anymore. So I was like, all right. So I was headed over to the second house. The other agent calls me and says, hey, that just sold. They don't want to do the open house anymore. So there goes not only the open houses that I was going to do, that I should have gotten a couple of buyers off of each one, but also the content that I was going to do to promote them. Mm -hmm. So I created this video, and I said one script in front of two different houses. And the basic script was, don't wait on the open house. You know, if you've seen this property online, don't wait on the open house because this one or this one may sell and then there's no open house. So don't wait on the open house for a property. That was bas the basic premise. I said the same script in front of both houses and then I just switched, right? I would just go from 
uh, scene to scene. Okay. And it got real fast at the end where I was basically switching in the middle of the sentence, saying the same thing in front of two houses. Okay. I'm um, trying to get real creative, you know, see, is this going to work? Is it not going to work? What is it? Uh, I don't even think there was music behind it then. Like it was just me talking in a beanie, partly in my truck, partly in front of these houses. <laughs> and I got a lot of leads off of it. And I thought, wow, this could, this could be the game changer. Like this, this real estate video thing might work. And this is even before there were lives or anything. So I made another video standing in front of a house, talking about the house, and then I would show the house. And then I was like, hey, if you're interested in this, let me know. And that blew up. I was like, wow, this is this good. Action. Yeah. So that just kind of created a love for the, the video and the creative process because I am a creative, but I felt like I was stuck in this analytical job. Um, well, you're good. You're, I mean, well, obviously, I mean, you're good at both. And so <clears throat> I think sometimes the challenge that we have is um, when we are blessed with several, with lots of talent. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that I would go to that point. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, and, um, yeah. you know, and, and I'll say a mentor of mine told me um, uh, before I said, you know, sometimes the, um, you know, what she actually said was that, you know, the devil can spin you around. Yeah, it's because true. you, you're, um, because you are talented can get you. Yeah, focus, focus and unfocused. You know, and I've, ch I've, yeah. I've had that challenge. And so, you know, so, but you're, you're good at both. You're good at data, obviously, yeah. and you're creative. What's interesting is the part of data I love is the interpretation of it, which I think if you analyze most guys that do a lot of data, it's pretty creative because you can make that data look like anything. Like those news outlets, mm -hmm. they're yeah, making yeah. the data favorite. It's the same data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think there is some creativity in just analyzing the data, but the part of the job I, I despised is like the paperwork and the timelines and, and I know them, I know them cold because I've been doing this for so long. I know the contract timelines, I know, but it's the actual process of doing that that destroys my soul. What I love to do is a, have an idea about a video and then try to figure out, like, how do they, how would I shoot that? If I've seen something similar, how did that person shoot that? You know, what can I do in a limited setup? Is it possible for me to make something similar to this $5,000 shoot with my camera and a gimbal? Is that possible? And so I like to figure that out. My problem with that is sometimes when I figure that out, I'll, I'll lose interest. I won't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'll give anything to continue to be that consistent, rote. It's not heartless, but it feels heartless just doing the same thing over and over and over. Because I know in the long run, that repetitive thing is what's really going to make me successful. Right. So I do have to the boring business. find the boring business and be very good at it. But that's the part I'm not, not great. So anyway. We're working on yeah, oh, where did you get there? We're working progress. So I've built a couple of teams along the way, failed a couple of teams. I built a brokerage. We partnered that brokerage with Real this year. And I'm basically rebuilding a team, going back into production again. And I feel like this time, 16 years into it, I actually have some of the leadership skills I need, not only to make me more successful than I could possibly be on my own, but to also make my team more successful than they could possibly be on their own. And, you know, there've been people that have asked my team members, like, hey, what would it take to get you to join my team? And one of my team members, Matt, said Ray would have to die. I was like, well, thanks, man. You're putting, a compliment? A hit, putting a hit out. Is that a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> so gonna kill it. This other team leader is going to kill me off. But so. <laughs> be like, right, birth of a new bigger conglomerate right. team. So, but, but that loyalty isn't loyalty for loyalty's sake. It's loyalty because the leadership is actually a servanthood to them as agents, making them more successful than they could possibly be alone. And if I ever lose that, if I ever look at it as I'm the leader, so they're serving my purpose, I think that's when they leave. That's when it's all over. So as much as possible, I'm going to try to continue to serve them and continue to serve that team and help them to serve my clients and the people that have reached out to me instead of, hey, I'm going to do this. Come over and help me. Come over and help me. I think that will destroy the team faster than anything. Yeah. So you pour into them. They pour into your clients. Yeah. Everyone wins. Yeah. The clients win. They win. And ultimately, yeah. like Zig Ziglar said, you help everyone be successful by default. Yeah. It'll come, come back. Successful. You can give more value to the marketplace than you take out and it'll come back to you.
Awesome, yeah. Pretty good. Gym run. Yeah. So yeah, no so tell us about your family. So you said you your wife was in Central, you were a little south of there. Yeah, yeah, my the kids, little little family, yeah. But young one, I think. Kids, yeah. We both have but... I don't talk at all about my family on social media or anything okay. because there's like a Stalkers. you know there's well yeah, there's weird people out there. And anytime there's two reasons. One is there's weird people. Sorry if you're a weird person watching. There's <laughs> no <laughs> no, 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 no. But I mean, there are, I mean, there's some people that say weird stuff and I don't want to put them online. I guess there's three reasons I do this. The other reason is I don't want to post my kids on Instagram for the likes to serve my business, right? My Instagram is heavy about business. It's also got my personality through it, but it's not private. It's personal, Mm -hmm. but it's not private. My private life is still private. So I also don't put them on because we don't know the long-term effects of our kids being on social media. That is true. Right? I grew up, I'm the Oregon Trail generation. It's like this little micro generation between the, or in the oldest millennial group. And uh, so, so I just turned 40. So it's called the Oregon Trail generation because we all grew up. Yeah, we got a similar birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Almost exactly. We all grew up playing outside. And then when we were in high school, computers came in the home. And so because we are so well versed and back then, like if you wanted a computer, you had to build it, right? If you wanted a website, you had to program HTML, right? Now, like no one, no one, hardly anyone knows that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there's a lot of tech people. I'm just saying like in general, like I think it's hard for millennials to understand that if you wanted a computer back then, you pretty much had to build it yourself. Like this is you, we received parts. We had to put the parts together and that was our computer. Right. So Depending everyone knew a how little good bit. or bad you were at yeah. putting the parts together yeah. to determine how, the, how, how fast how your it was. On. And you could talk to somebody about motherboards back then, and they, you know, they could, you know, tell you what new processes are on motherboards, all this stuff. These days, people are like, I don't, I don't know, I just buy the thing. So, growing up in that generation, we didn't experience social media. I was the last graduate, the last graduating class before Facebook was in college. So social media came right after college, but we were all very techy and into it. So we adopted it really quickly, even right after college. Mm -hmm. But our kids growing up with that, what's the long-term effect of your kid posting something and after two or three days, there's only a couple of likes. What's the long-term impact of that social engagement? Because that is the new future, is that social engagement. So a lot, oftentimes people are like, are you, do you have, I have a family, I have a wife, five kids, 12, 10, 7, 4, and new. Uh, the, I have four girls, a boy. Yeah, four girls and a boy. It's, so uh-huh. the boy is the next to last one. Yeah, I've got the, my boys are the oldest, and then I've got the three girls. Yeah. My young so you, 10. Full but, this, but it's a good, good point you make with the, because the 10 year old just got her phone back. She went a year and changed yeah. it without a phone. She got a phone at eight, which I guess. I mean, I didn't have a phone at eight, but now I guess that seems like that's when you give a kid a phone. I don't know. I mean, our kids, so our kids have phones. They have all the tech, but they have our old phones and they don't work if there's no Wi-Fi. You know, mm-hmm. so there's still, there's uh, some natural constraints. Yeah. They have to ask us before they use them. They have, you know, I grew up playing video games like crazy. They have video games in the house, but they have to, you know, be time it, be careful with their time. And mm-hmm. we want to play outside as much as possible, play with other kids as much as possible. So we homeschool and all that stuff too. So it's a little, it's a little wild around the house. My office studio is in the house. Okay. So, which is great because I'm the principal. Right, the, the hey, principal, guys. the parent, right. You know, you treat your teacher, your mom differently because that is also my wife. Right. <laughs> so there's, there's those moments, but for the most part of it, I can get to come out and have lunch with them. And so it's, it's a cool arrangement, but they're- That's cool. Yeah, That's cool. it's really cool. But I think they're gonna get into stuff like YouTube far earlier you know, into the video scene that I was because I got all the equipment and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. And our kids want to do this cooking channel and they're, they've already shot the videos for it. They're editing them themselves at first to see how well they do there and learn. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity on that platform specifically because it's a little more protective of the interaction with kids. And, uh, it's, uh, it's different than like a Facebook or an Instagram or you know, there's no DMs there or anything like that that I have to worry about. But it'll be, of course, managed by us. But right. For them to ex- start to experience some kind of online community that way, I think is on a little say on, on YouTube. Yeah, YouTube, YouTube yeah. kids. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's a little bit. I think it's a little bit nicer. Yeah. A little bit kind of. You know, they have different rules. Like commenting rules are different mm-hmm. than than it is on the regular 
YouTube, so it protects them from the trolls and yeah, pretty cool. And and I'll share a funny story. My um my ten year old had a basketball game the other day and bought it and 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 went online and you know asked to buy something with her money and got a, got a Bluetooth mic and then wanted and then asked could. She wanted to put, the, I was like, did, did, you can't wear the mic during the bathroom. She wanted she to be mic'd up. She said she wanted to be mic'd up. <laughs> I was like, where, where, where are you getting this? And so I was like, I don't think that. The where mic- is she getting that? I think we know. <laughs> she, said, but she said, well, there are different refs this week than last week. I said, and so she went and asked the ref. The ref said, we're going to talk to the head table. And then she looked back at me. I was like, your team's doing, already doing their warm ups. You're still trying to get the mic thing. And she looked at me and she said, and I was like, okay, good. Because I didn't want to have to try to figure it out. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, and kids, no. I mean, but it's indifferent. It's I mean, they're just so adaptive to the technology where it's so normal for them to be in those environments, which is great because I think it's going to really benefit them in the future. You know, they practice texting with their little girls group or whatever. They're texting stuff all the time and uh, they're learning how to do that. I think that's important because if they don't know how to text quickly, you don't think that's going to be a job skill in the future? Like, what's your words per minute typing? Mm-hmm. What's your text per minute? Text per minute, yeah. You know, that, that kind of stuff that, is yeah. going to be out there. But So I think it's important for them to learn all that. They're actually slower typers than they are texters, which is wild. But they'll, you know, they'll pick it up because I, you know, I didn't do any computers until I was like 13. You know, that's when we started building them. So I'm a pretty fast typer now. I think they're going to be okay if they, don't, if they have to wait to get into all that. So... Uh, but we're just kind of easing them in to the technological world. The first games they played, it wasn't the Switch. It was one of those old Nintendo classics. So they went on the same path I did, okay. playing Mario first, like the old Mario, mm-hmm. playing the old Kirby. Like They had those experiences before we started to advance them in the technology so they could appreciate. Right. You know. But I, re- I remember being a kid at the arcade and seeing Super Mario and all of our minds being blown about how real that was. Right? <laughs> Super, really? Super, yeah. But everyone was like, whoa, it's like a real guy jumping around. Like, that was amazing. Yeah, no, now, I'll tell you, I was trying to find um, the uh, the FIFA uh, quarterfinals yeah. the other day, and so I was online just real quick, because I heard they were on penalty shots, and I wanted to try to find it real quick. I put on the thing, and I click on something on YouTube, and it took me like 10 seconds to realize, this is a freaking cartoon. Like, this was the, <laughs> this was the game. I'm watching. <laughs> Fake soccer, <laughs> and then I was like, "It looks real." I was like, "It looks so real." Yeah, and so same it's gonna thing. it's gonna continue to do that, and, and you know, with the deep fake and all that stuff that's happening, and we're probably way off subject, but there's so much that technology is doing to change, and it's changing so fast that I think it behooves us, especially as dads, to make sure that our kids can understand the differences. And so we're gonna be really bad in the future when they show a president saying something. We're gonna go, okay. You believe he just said that on video? And our kids are gonna go, no, 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 that wasn't real. That was a deep fake. Here's how you can tell. Look at this and that pixel and stuff. We're gonna be like, what? Right. Well, so, I mean, that's where it's going. If you haven't seen deep fake Tom Cruise and stuff like that, it's amazing. I haven't. Yeah. It's a guy on TikTok that deep fakes Tom Cruise. It looks just like Tom. He's doing all this funny, weird stuff. It's not, it's not Tom, but it, if you look at it, you'd think it is. And so that's the kind of stuff I think that in the future, that's going to be wild. You know, having an actor show up that's been passed away for years and they show up as an actor in a movie. I mean, yes. Yeah. That's going to happen. That's probably going to happen in three or four years. That's, that's there. So it's don't think about that stuff, but I mean, on how, you know, kind of what we do as marketers, you know, like you can, um, I guess you can use it for good or evil, right? I mean, you, you can, it's like a brick. It's amoral, right? You can build a house or throw it through a window and rob somebody, but it's it's just a brick. So I think some of this stuff will be interesting, especially in the context of real estate. Like someone right now can put their basically their phone on their face with one of those cardboard things mm-hmm. and be in a large space and walk around at a listing. They can just walk around a virtual listing. They can do that right now. Right. Well, as the whole metaverse and all that stuff starts to expand and as augmented reality starts to expand, I think there are gonna be some really interesting opportunities for real estate agents to play in that space. But the one thing that you have to watch is the quality for your client. And we are always quality first for our client. So when we started doing video, uh, most of, like we put so much money into listing videos to get the highest possible quality because that's on behalf of our client. 
Right. And there was early 360 tours that we tried to do and it was a little bit grainy and blurred and we didn't feel like it showed the house in the best quality compared to the photos. So we wouldn't put it out. Mm -hmm. And there were some sellers at the time saying, we want one of those things. I was like, well, here's the quality. Like, take a look at it. Here are your photos. Beautiful. We would rather everyone just look at your photos. Is that okay with you? And they're like, yeah. Then when the quality got to 4K, that's when we started adopting it and putting it into practice. It's not when the lack of knowledge, we knew how to use the tool, but at the time the tool wasn't good enough for our standard of quality. And I think agents are going to have to put that kind of stuff in place because they're going to be doing something like, oh, I'm going to put this house onto some kind of virtual platform and all this, you know, metaverse, and we're going to put this on NFTs and to take it and put it on the blockchain, which is all good ideas as long as it serves the client. But as soon as the agent starts to serve themselves with the big new thing, it's just going to end it. It's going to end the opportunity. It's going to could end their career. Yeah. And I think, and that's a good, good thing you bring up is, I think it just comes back to standards. Yes. And if we, and a lot of, um, you know, and not just agents, but you know, businesses, you know, don't necessarily have standards. They'll just, you know, take on any client or any, you know, you can breathe, you can sell real estate type of deal. Yeah. Right. And so that's yeah. one thing that, um, you know, brokerages deal with, you know, in terms of growing agent count and, you know, are these yep. quality agents or are they producing agents or yep. are they just agents? Right. Or licensees. And are they going to pay the monthly bill? Monthly fee. And that's the, and that's the standard or the minimum standards yeah. as the card go through. That's so true. Right. Yeah. That's a big part of the problem in real estate, but it does afford, you know, groups like us that are actually well-versed and well-skilled. It affords us a lot of opportunity. To show the comparison, you know, is you show up on time and you're better than most. Yeah. <laughs> That's not about it. unfortunate to say, but that yeah. if the if the if the bar is low and you can jump high, then it's like, wow, you know, you're so eighty seven percent failure rate in business right now. So it's just nuts. Yeah. That is. So tell me, so you know, we're let's talk real. Yeah. It's real. Yeah. <laughs> so give me a give me a what's a, a either a crazy scenario or you know, Tell them, share a story that you've had. It could be with a client, could be, um, oh man, yeah, it could be with a cu client or customer. Let me be sure. I don't know how they have in Arkansas. I'm thinking of one that's appropriate. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is <a> PG 13. <laughs> you know, you can, you know, a little bit. You can go. Uh, uh, I mean, there's been, there's been so many instances. This is, it's difficult to think through because I really do think our brains kind of erode the terrible ones. Um, I mean, for instance, I can remember a guy that would not stop talking every time I got on the phone with him, it was 30 minutes to an hour. And I referred him to another agent in the marketplace. <laughs> so there's like weird, little weird things like that that we do. Um, uh, let's see, what's something strange. I guess I've been pretty blessed if I can't think of an absolutely weird thing. I'll tell you one off air. Right. <laughs> and yeah, we'll, we'll save that one for later. Yeah. Right. Uh, so tell, I mean, you, 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 you mentioned earlier that you've, um, that you, you know, you had your, you had your brokerage, you merged your, your yep. brokerage into, into real, and then you're, now you're kind of relaunching yep. your team, you know, I, and, and you've been licensed for 16, 16 years. years. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure that, um, that entire 16 years was all pretty easy. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, the crash was right, right in the middle of right. the, uh, but yeah. other than that, other than, than that. that but you know what? What um, you know? Share a little. Share a story about um, about adversity and yeah. how you've um, you know how because we all face adversity. You know, we all have challenges. We all have adversity yeah. on, on different levels. Um, some greater than others. But you know, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you handle that in your business and maintain your family of five or maybe right. four at the time? Yeah. Your um, you know your business. You know, yeah. still try to have some social, still try to have um, a somewhat of a social life, try to still give back to the community. How do you handle all of that? And, and what has been a, you know, kind of a situation that you had to deal with and how did you, how did you treat it? Well, it's been interesting. I watched uh, The Big Short just a couple of years ago and I told my wife after I feel so much better about my own failure in 20, 2008, 9, 10, because, after watching that because I always kind of felt like in the back of my mind, like, I you can't, know, what, what did I do so wrong? You know, I was a newer agent. I didn't have really contacts. 
back before the crash, none of my friends had money, but they could still buy a house. After the crash, even my friends with money couldn't buy a house. So it was a really weird situation to be in. And I always kind of looked at that as a failure through some of that because I had to get out of residential real estate and start doing some other things to, to make it to survive. And after watching that movie, I was like, it wasn't really a failure. It was just a, a switch for a while because it affected everyone so negatively. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't, I knew, I knew it was a worldwide crash in my brain, but I didn't realize that in my heart level, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So in 2019, was that the first year or was it 2020? It was 2020. So 2019 was a tough year for, uh, 2017 was a very tough year for us. Um, I was, that's when I actually became nationally recognized. I started speaking around the country, teaching other agents to do what we were doing. And it was really great. I finally had someone on my team in place that was taking a lot of the workload off. We were about to buy our first house and the, uh, the buyer agent that I had was a wonderful friend of mine. She was like my right hand man type of person, you know, um, and she died in a freak accident wow. and it kind of turned my personal life for like three months was weird because it was just like unbelievable because this was a person I would talk to probably 30 times a day, you know, and gone. And then I had to also work through the client she was working with, take back over the clients I had given her, sort all of that out. Meanwhile, still being asked to speak and do stuff. And it was just a tough, that was a tough year. At the end of that year, the brokerage I was at said, hey, we don't want to continue with you in 2018 because we don't feel like you're a culture fit anymore. I was like, why? And they're like, well, you're the top producer by double the second producer here. And... Uh, we don't want you to start your own brokerage while you're here. And so I said, okay, what do you want to do? Like a 30 day, you know, Hey, thanks guys for your help and for helping me get where we are. And now I'm going to go do this other thing. Cause it was a lot. I had 14, 12 or 14 deals pending. And they said, no, we want you to be out by Tuesday. And that was December 29th. Tuesday was uh, July 2nd, I think. And nothing, you know, the MLS is closed. That was Friday at three o'clock when they told me that the MLS is closed, nothing's open. And so I really, that was some adversity. I was trying to recover from that because I really felt like they were just trying to take my legs out. I didn't really quite understand why. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a brand that I was willing to partner with and take them wherever they wanted to go. And so I was very confused about what was happening. Uh, that's when we started my own brokerage. So I didn't really start a brokerage by choice, but by have to. Mm -hmm. And, um, I went to a friend's brokerage for a month and then launched my own. Well, it was hard. It was a lot of work, a lot of work. And we went into 2020 and I, we, we made the plan for the year at the end of 2019, I always kind of plan the next year. And we put our calendar out there and my wife and I re literally wrote at the top of the year, year of vacations. We were going to take six to eight vacations that year. I had only had maybe one vacation a year uh, for several years prior. And it was like real short, you know, it was like wet, uh, Friday to yeah, Monday. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so um, I was working so hard that we were like, we're just going to go. We went on one ski vacation and then we came back from that as people were announcing that there was people all over the country getting sick. And... My word for the year, uh, in January, I, I hated, and I always try to pick like a word to help inspire and like, just kind of sh maybe shape the year or move me forward. And I had this word, it was like actually a two word. And it was the only thing I could think of, like, this is dumb. I don't like this word. I'm going to come up with a different word, but every day I would think of it and it would just, it was so in my face and I didn't understand why that was my word for the year until March. And the phrase was, keep going. And when March happened and everything shut down, the first thought was, was keep going. Yeah. And so Katie, my wife was like, what are we going to do? I was like, we're going to keep going. Like, whatever it is, we're just going to keep going. Let's go. 
And so we really tried to double down in all our efforts. And I think there was a lot of survival there. You know, some country or some places around the nation, just, you know, agents were able to double, triple, quadruple their production. We were able to do pretty well. I was running a brokerage at the time, so I wasn't focused on my own production at all. I was just trying to help the agents go. Like, let's go, let's go. So I built uh, some of their businesses up nicely. Uh, <laughs> so we, I mean, that was the focus. And it was actually such a focus that I kept that for another year. And for, so for those two years that became, I guess you could say the COVID years, my, 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 not oh, initial, sure. but my, yeah, almost mantra, my words were keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. So that's been a, it was a trying time, you know, part of my brain as, as the market was doing weird stuff, I thought, you know, I'm not going to back down this time. Like, I'm just going to keep, keep going. And what I really think is interesting is what we thought was going to be a really hard downturn in uh, real estate was not. It was a really hard downtime personally, where you lost connection with people, you couldn't see family, you couldn't gather, you couldn't. So the personal detriment, the how it impacted people's heart, the day to day, yeah, and the day to day was so drastically changed compared with what was happening in real estate that now, two years later. I think this is the year where we're going to start to see some of that impact hitting real estate. We're going to see some of the agents that have been licensed for two years say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, you know, I could put a sign in the air and the thing would sell. It's not selling. What's going on? What am I doing wrong? And the sky's falling. Yeah. And so now is really what I think the opportunity is for agents that have studied the markets, that know their contracts, that know how to serve clients and speak with them. I think this is really their opportunity to shine moving forward. So do you have, have you, so would you, do you have your word for 2023 yet? I don't, I'm still thinking no, about it. Okay. Yeah. I would, I would, I didn't know if it was shareable or not. Well, on, you, so yeah. it, it is kind of usually when it's over, but I don't have one uh, coming up yet. The word for this year was blast off, which ironically is the year where we took our brokerage and partnered with a national firm that has started to really take off. So it's kind of neat to see how, you know, it's maybe a little bit serendipitous, a little bit what you focus on expands. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, probably a little bit divine. An affirmation. Yeah. I mean, really, what if yeah. if you're saying this to yourself and this is your word of the year, yeah. <clears throat> it only makes sense that things that happen in your life are aligned with yeah. you know, the reticular activators are going. You start to see those opportunities. So I'm really excited about where we're headed moving forward. You know, Our goal is to build a $200 million team, which there, I don't think there is one in the state of Arkansas. There may be up in north, northwest Arkansas, but... Our goal is to eventually have a $200 million team, and I think we have the right people on our team in order to make that happen uh, for the first time in a long time. And I think, you know, moving forward, the brokerage and the growth nationally that we can achieve and the expansion opportunities, it's just never been, it's never been better. So I'm super stoked about so it. How, so now that you're, I mean, you, you're merged with the national team. So if, if, so it sounds like folks that could join your office um, if they wanted to kind of partner with you in Arkansas or really anywhere, it's yeah. like, um, yeah. And then also if they, if you had a, uh, somebody that wanted to buy a house in, in Little Rock or maybe sell a house yeah. in Little Rock yeah. or anywhere, right. Yeah. How would folks read? Yeah. So Instagram is like the best place to find me, uh, Ray Zorbach, R-A-Y-Z-O-R-B-A-C-K. It's a long story why I have that name. I'm a Razorback Arkansas fan, obviously, but, um, uh, but yeah, that's a funny, that used to be my tagline back in college. I just kept it. Uh, now that's your, yeah, now that's my handle on Instagram. So Ray Zorbeck, R-A-Y-Z-O-R-B-A-C-K. And we can, I mean, I mean, you know, if somebody needs to sell a house in New York or whatever, they just call yeah. you and you have this amazing network. Um, so there's that, but yeah, if they're in, if they're in the Little Rock area, I would probably just tell them to call you because then you're going to send them to me. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but that's no, you right. take it. Nice. <laughs> Ray Zorbeck. Okay. Yeah. So awesome. And I've got a, um. I've got a quote of the day. I'm nice. All right. Quote of the day. Data are just summaries of thousands of stories. Tell a few of those stories to help make the data meaningful. Chip and Dan Hugh. Yeah. That's apropos. Data King. Yeah. All right. Good thanks, stuff, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for, thanks for joining. Bring it up. Yeah. Bring it up.